guess I got to say that welcome everyone on the Facebook live stream and uh, all that. And you know, I'm, I'm on the spot here, so I'm just going to roll with what's in my heart. You know, uh, that's one thing that God is putting on my heart here lately is uh, uh, I told him here a while back that, uh, you know, whenever uh, a ministry is began, you, 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 our human nature is to, to judge how good of a minister you are on the feedback you get from the people sitting in the chairs. And it's just natural. It's your flesh. It's natural for you to judge how good of a sermon you preached on how many amens you get or how excited the crowd is. Or the big thing is when the service is over, how many people runs up to you and tells you good job and this and that and puffs you up a little bit, you know, and it makes you feel good and you walk out thinking, boy, I really done good today. I want to tell you about a different story real quick. I understand that because when, whenever I, you know, and I've only been, I, I don't even like to label myself as a minister because you know, it's not something that uh, I strive for or whatever. It's a place where I was positioned, not by my own will, but by a higher will, God's will. It was nothing that I ever done or whatever. So if that's the case, and see, the only person that can tell you this morning that I was positioned in this position is me. Because I know what went on in here in order to position me in this position. So if I know what went on within me in here to position me within this position, I can't take credit for any of it. So therefore, if I can't take credit for any of it, then any outward credit that's given to me ain't mine. And that's a tough thing, I believe, in this day that... Uh, what we call, what is being brought forth is, we know the Melchizedek order. It's something that's very heavy within me right now that, you know, and I, like I say, I don't have the understanding of it. But it's where, where I'm at and what God, where, what God is showing me. And anything in that order, you can't take credit for. Amen. Because it ain't going to be none of you. I was telling them. Um, Rachel, my wife, she, she's real soft-hearted, you know, and all that. And uh, it's like, for me, it's like whenever you give somebody a Christmas gift, you, you, you judge how well they enjoy that gift by the reaction you get back from them. You know, oh, I love that gift. Thank you so much. And the more they pour that on, the more that you, uh, you know they liked it. And if they don't give you none of that reaction back, you think, well, they don't like it. And I told Rachel, I'm just going to tell this story. This man, this man sitting over here, it's about you, so I'm going to tell on you. You put me up here, now i got to. <laughs> but, you know, you all know him by now, you know, and I know him, you all know him, and you ain't going to get much of a reaction out of him if you give him a gift or anything else, you know. And uh, Rachel gave him a present last week, and she said, I don't think he liked it. <laughs> she said, and uh, I said, Rachel, I said, you can't judge anything off of anybody's expression. But God started dealing with me. And he said, it was like, we've diluted what love really is. You know, we can say, uh, I love my job. We also say, I love my wife. Them are two different levels of love there. Yeah. And we, 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 we downplay it. I love my dog. I love this. I love, we love everything. We even tell each other we love each other. But man, we've downplayed what love really is. And, I, and it started dealing with me sitting back there, and I said, do we even really know what love really is, or have we just used that terminology and and just diluted it and made it whatever to downplay it. So love has almost lost its substance. You know, when I tell Aaron I love him, I do love you. 
but we ain't got an intimate relationship. You know? I love you on a level, but it ain't on an intimate level. And I probably don't love you like love really means. And, and I told her, I said, you know, I said, I know the pastor. And I know he loved that gift that you give him. He ain't going to tell you he loves it. He ain't going to come hug your neck, give you a kiss, and tell you he, how much he loves it. <laughs> but, he lo <laughs> but he loves it. But he loves it on a level. A diluted level of love. And, you know, you can see what I'm trying to get at here is we measure these things, and that's how we look at things. But in the reality of it, I remember the night I was sitting in my apartment by myself, by myself, alone, under the influence of drugs. And I remember I was at a point, and I cried out, you know, I said, God, if you're really as big and bad as you say you are and everybody else says you are, then I need help. And I never cried out like that before. But, you know, I understood that God had drove me to a point to bring me to that place to where I cried out with a sincere heart. And it wasn't until the appointed time that he had with me. That was just an appointed time for my uh, relationship to begin. And what happened is his spirit began to pour out upon me or reveal to me, however you want to say it, light began to shine or revealing began to take place within me. And love filled my, my heart and my mind. But it was a love that a mother can't give me, a father couldn't give me, a wife can't give me. Nobody else can give me that love that I felt that night. And it was that kind of love that changed everything within me. And I'm still going after that kind of love this morning. That's the love I'm looking for. And I'm realizing that there's nothing in the natural. Material things, uh, people, anything in the natural cannot fulfill that love that I felt that night. And I see that, you know, in this order that we're coming into is a different order that we've never, a road we've never been down before. And until we are filled I believe that a people is going to be filled with that kind of love where you are a blessing unto a people. You're no longer looking to be blessed. You're no longer praying, Lord, give me this. Give me this. Do this for me, Lord. Because you are now the blessing. You are the blessing. See, it's a maturity stage also to where, you know, we're not, we're not like kids asking for stuff all the time. And that's, and, but the hardest thing we're ever going to have to face is getting to that point to where we say, I'm not looking for that reaction anymore. I'm not looking for that reaction if I bless you. I don't need nothing back from you. I don't even need a reaction back from you to know that it's accomplished. It's no different than for me when the word does not return void. And you know, it's like I said the other night, it's like, did Jesus walk around the streets asking for anything? He never walked around asking for anything. Can you give me this? Can you give me this? He just simply exerted himself. You know, he spoke and it was done. So this time that we're in, our human nature wants these reactions, these feelings, these emotions. That's how we gauge even church services. Was it a hot, hot one? You know, it's not like that for me no more. I can, I, I can simply hear somebody talk, hear a sound within them, and it resonates within me, and my spirit can be leaping, and I'm just sitting there being cool. It's not that the preacher ain't doing a good job, or it ain't, and it, it don't even have to be behind the pulpit anymore. I'm seeing a life and hearing a life within a people. It can be at Walmart, anywhere. This time that we're coming in, we're going to have to learn to lay aside our emotions 
desires, the way we see things, because it ain't about you anymore. If you're called into this Melchizedek order, then you are coming in whether you want to or not, because it's who you are. It was like, and I'm not saying I'm special, trust me. I struggle daily with things within my mind. But the hardest thing for me is understanding that it's God that is changing me. It's not the devil is in control in doing this, and I'm not being attacked. I'm just losing my understanding of things. And it brings forth a uncomfortability. And these things have to be revealed in me in order to be dealt with. The question is, how do we deal with them? Do we do it with our own understanding? Or do we rely on the Spirit to handle that? Because to, to, I, can, I, can, I can handle something in my own way of understanding on how to deal with it. But deep down within me, I know the way it should be handled. And like I said, it's, it's like that Bible verse. It's like me ministering even. Get this, it's me, what we call ministering. Me standing here behind this pulpit and speaking is a challenge to me. And it's a challenge because it goes against my fleshly desires. Because it requires something of me, like they say. It requires something out of me. But as Paul said, if I did not fulfill the responsibility that was given within me, it would be much more of a burden unto me. And I understand that. If I did not fulfill what God has put in me in order to be the position that he's put in me, to, to release what he's given me, if I did not do that, I would sit and struggle every day knowing that I'm not fulfilling that position or calling that he's placed upon me. And, uh, you know, and it's just such a trying time. But it's a dual concept because in one side, it's a trying time. On the other side, it's the most greatest time I've ever experienced in my life. Today is the greatest day I've ever seen in this world. Right now, this moment is the greatest time I've ever seen. And this moment just left. Right now is the greatest time I've ever seen in my life. You see what I'm saying? And that moment just left. I heard a man say there's really no time as the present. Because once this present just happened, it's over. You know, I mean, is there really a present? It's just the time, you know, and this, this, I, I'm so excited and uh, I hope, you know, Dennis exerts, you know, uh, what's in his heart about it. Because a lot of people knows, or knows head knowledge about the Melchizedek priesthood. We've heard about it in the Bible. We've heard about, you know, this and that. Was, oh, yeah, I know about the Melchizedek priesthood. You know what? I, I, I've done a lot of studying, and I'm not tooting my horn. I read, I listen, I, I, I exert myself in all that. And I haven't heard a lot of people talk about the Melchizedek priesthood the way it, that I, the way it speaks when it speaks to me. I haven't heard a lot of, you don't hear messages in the church system a lot about the Melchizedek priesthood. I believe this word that's coming forth in this day about this priesthood is going to speak to people's hearts and their minds and it's going to change the way that we're going to look at what this priesthood really is. And for me that's an exciting thing because understand there was priesthoods, there was priesthoods, there was priesthoods. This ain't Childish stuff. This is priesthoods. Priesthoods, priesthoods, Levitical priesthoods, all these other priesthoods. You know, it wasn't talking about whatever. These were priesthoods. But then there was the priesthood. The separated out of all these priesthoods. You know, so you have, you have your preachers and your priests and this and that and your priesthood. But you have a people separated out of all of that separated for a specific purpose a priesthood out of a priesthood so uh you know we're in the greatest time we ever seen i'm excited about it and uh 
uh, I encourage you. It's, you can't, not every one of us sitting in here can have the conversation about a Melchizedek priesthood right now and the true meaning of it. We've got to be brought up. The, the revelation of who God is in the, this priesthood has to be revealed to you. And it's important that uh, we, we clear our minds and listen to what God has to say. Because this is a serious deal. And you know, if you ever wonder why things are the way they are or why you've been drawn to this place, it's like, like our brother back there from Waldron. He, uh, he's not here just because uh, he likes to drive from Waldron, Arkansas every Sunday. He's listening for a sound. He wants to hear something. There's a stern within him. You know, so uh, I'm going to turn this over to Dennis and uh, bless all y'all out there in the Facebook world. And uh, y'all welcome Dennis James. Y'all welcome Jamie Sullivan. So to say, I don't look quite like Dennis James, but <laughs> well, I do. You're right, Dad. I do. I look just like you. Maybe a little difference here and there. <laughs> it's nice to be here today. Um, thank you guys for letting me get up here and speak. I just really wanted to kind of update you guys since I haven't seen everyone in a while and what's been going on in my life. Uh, as many of, and many of you know that you know I've been in addiction for 25 plus years, and uh, during that time period, you know I've lo I'd lost everything. I've lost my home, my children, my vehicle, uh, my self-respect, <laughs> everything else that came along with uh, drug addiction. But um, God has really been working on me, and you know slowly and gradually He has been bringing me out of the depths of hell that I had been in and you know I was I was way out I was in a place where I didn't think I could come back I knew I couldn't have on my own there's no way um, but through God and him working in me um, it has, has brought me back gradually and it's been I've been staying at mom and dad's house now for going on 10 months so I've got 10 months clean which is an absolute miracle thank you <laughs> an absolute miracle in itself and um, I've got to you know I haven't seen my kids in over three years and uh, we went to court when was it a couple months ago now a couple yeah you know, about a month ago and so I've been seeing my kids during the entire month of December I'm getting to see them and we're seeing them at a place in Fort Smith right now where it's supervised visitation and so we're doing that for three months, and then we're going to go from there and go to unsupervised. But um, it's just been, that has been a blessing and a miracle in and of its own, just to be able to see my children. And knowing that <clears throat> I was really concerned about my oldest daughter because there's a lot of anger and resentments and stuff built up from the time lapse and, and from where I've been. And... You know, it was amazing, and God just does amazing things, you know. Um, but I'd, I'd had kind of low uh, self, you know, expectations of the whole thing because I didn't know how she was going to react, how, how it was going to work out the first time I saw her. If she was just going to reject me, not talk to me, I had no idea. And when she came in and she saw my face, she just ran to me and told me that she loved me and she had missed me. And that right there is a miracle. If you guys, um, if you didn't know, it's it's a complete miracle. And so, and then also on Christmas, uh, which is not court ordered, my ex-husband has decided that they're going to let the kids come up and stay with us for four hours and be able to visit with us on Christmas. So that's another miracle. So God has just done some amazing things in my life, and he's brought me so far, and and. I just keep seeing just miracle after miracle that he's doing in my life. And I can't wait to see where this goes. I'm so excited about this journey. And I thank you guys all for standing beside me and in your prayers and, and everything and upholding our family during this time. And that's all I really had to say. I just wanted to let you guys know how things are going out here in <laughs> Jamie's world. <laughs> thank you. Now, this is Dennis James. <laughs>
let them get all the good stuff out of the way. <laughs> it's, uh, it's been a while since I've been here. You know, uh, you look at Jamie, she says 10 months. You know, that, wasn't, that didn't come, you know, all down the hallelujah lane. That come with a lot of battles between us and her and everything else that was going on. And that's what I want to talk to you about. You know, the reason, the reason I believe the Melchizedek order is not talked about much is because what goes with it. You know, we tend to, we, we tend to uh, put our own labels on stuff. Uh, for instance, God can give a revelation and we interpret it the way our soul or our mind desires to interpret it. And that's what I want to talk to you about. Melchizedek is an order. People, people think it's an inheritance. It's not. There's a big difference between an order and an inheritance. Amen? You inherit salvation. That's an inherent thing. Melchizedek is an order made in the order of Melchizedek. There's a big difference between the two. Amen? Notice that all the children of Israel really was included in the salvation of God bringing them out of Egypt. But they was not all included in the Leviticus priesthood. That was an order. Can you see that? So see, you can't lump all that in lump sum. I mean, that'd be like putting God in a box and saying, hey, this is God, and this is all there is to him. Amen? That can't be done. Because he's more than that. And another thing, you know, Clifton spoke about unity. I really want you to get understanding here. You can, you can have total unutilization in your life and be in unity. Did you hear that? You didn't hear that. <laughs> you know why we don't hear stuff? We don't want to hear it. Unity don't mean that I get along with you or you, you agree with me on everything. Unity is unity in the spirit with the Lord. I can be in unity in the spirit in the Lord and there can be total hell going on in my life. See how we, see how we measure things? Because we want unity to say, hey, we just love everybody and we get along with everybody. Unity's got to be in the spirit of the Lord. And I'm going to tell you something. If you don't think Jesus was in unity with the Father, then we hadn't seen a true revelation. And all the time that he was in complete union and, and communion and unity in the Lord and God the Father, he was in total chaos in this world. <laughs> you understand what I'm trying to say? Because, see... We want to take the best of this world and take it with us. It's not going to happen. His world is not of this world, none of it. Not one single part of this world is his world. Amen? Melchizedek order. In the book of Matthew, you'll, you'll know this story. And this is what I want to talk to you about. I want to talk to you about the true Melchizedek order. How many of you want the true Melchizedek order? Okay. How many of you have got the realization of it, what it really is, though? Or do you just see him following after Abraham and blessing him with wine and bread? Is that your concept of Melchizedek? Melchizedek, we hear the name of it. It says it in the book of Hebrews. He said he's the king of righteousness and of peace. That's the nature of it. Right? Okay? Because I can say Melchizedek don't make me in the Melchizedek order. <laughs> I wish it was that easy, Bob. Because <laughs> I can say Melchizedek many times. But it does not make me in that order. Are you following me? If you'll remember Peter, I love Peter. Peter reminds me of myself a lot. If you'll remember Peter at the crucifixion, 
He had just had a great revelation. And I'm going to tell you something about a great revelation. A great revelation will give you an uh, open door to the next falsehood. Did you hear that? Peter just had a great revelation, didn't he? He said, Thou art the Son of the living God. Peter even got bragged on by the Lord Jesus Christ himself. He said, Peter, flesh and blood has not revealed this unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. Now, wouldn't that make you feel good? Man, I've just had a true revelation out of the Spirit of God. Amen? All of a sudden, Jesus begins to preach the cross to Peter. You hear that? Jesus begins to tell him what's fixing to happen. He's not asking Peter's permission if it's going to happen. He's simply telling Peter what's fixing to happen to the revelation he just had. Oh, well. He said, the Son of Man will suffer at the hands of the people, will be hung up on a tree, and he will die upon that tree for humanity. And he will suffer many things beyond this night. And what did Peter do? See, the Melchizedek order, when you really start talking about the reason it's not preached in the church is because what I'm fixing to preach to you. The Melchizedek order is just this. Jesus is the Melchizedek order. And he's fixing to tell Peter what the Melchizedek order is fixing to happen to it. And Peter receives the great revelation of who he is but he fails to receive the revelation of what he's fixing to walk through. Oh, come on. Oh, give me all the blessings God had. Give me all the blessings that Melchizedek had, but don't tell me about the cross. Immediately, Peter says, Not so, Lord. Sound familiar? True prophets don't come to tickle your ear. Matter of fact, when true prophets showed up at a city, they would run out to see if he'd come to destroy them. Amen? They said, what's your intentions? <laughs> what are you really here to do? Are you for us or are you against us? How many of you know that Joshua asked that same thing when he entered the promised land? Here we are, a people. We crossed Jordan. We crossed death. We crossed the river of death. We're entering into the promised land. We're fixing to take Canaan land. And Joshua walks out in midnight hour, and there's a, there's a gigantic man standing there with his sword, sword drawn. And Joshua said, are you for us or are you for them? And he said, neither. God is not on our side, people. Can you hear me? He said, neither. I ain't for you and I ain't for the enemy. I am of the host of the Lord. I am here to do God's purpose. Amen? And if that's not our vision, and if that's not our understanding, or no matter what it costs the flesh, then we're missing the mark. Amen? Here's Peter. It wasn't moments before that he was a brave man. He cut a servant's ear off. Amen? Now he's standing at the warm fires of religion. Come on. And a little old servant girl runs him plumb off. <laughs> Amen? He said, aren't you part of that? No. No, I just had a revelation of the Christ. I'm not part of that revelation. Amen? That's Melchizedek order. See, when, 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 if you have that up there, would you go to, with me to the seventh chapter of the book of Hebrews while you have that up there? I'm glad you brought that up there. Seventh chapter of book of Hebrews. Yeah. Yeah, seven. There you go. 
Let's read here a minute. Okay? This Melchizedek was king of Salem, the priest of the God Most High. He made Abraham returning from the defeat of the kings and blessed him. And Abraham gave him a tenth of everything. First, the name Melchizedek means king of righteousness and also king of Salem means the king of peace. Without father, without mother, without geology, without the beginning of days and end of life, resembling the Son of God, he remains a priest forever. So that right there, in that right there in itself tells you that it's not inherited. It's an order. See there? You can't claim this and this and this in your ancestrals in order to walk in this. That's what he's saying. That's what the Greek of Hebrew is saying to you. You can't say, hey, I've, I've received salvation, now I'm Melchizedek. Wrong. It's a different order. Is that okay with y'all? We're talking about an order here. We're talking about a people coming into an order. Now, if I'm coming into an order, there has to be order in my life. Amen? So in order to bring order in my life, there's going to have to be something disordered. Something taken out. Amen? In order for something to come in, something has to leave. Okay? Now I wish I could sit here and, and, and tell y'all under the sound of my eloquent voice that all you had to do is listen to me and you're going to walk in this order. That'd be so easy, wouldn't it? Think about revelation. When you get revelation, there's a cost of it. Every revelation comes with a cost. Amen? It'll bless you on one minute, but on the next minute, it'll bring everything in your life to disorder in order to bring a true order. Amen? Where am I at? Oh, yeah, remains pretty fair. Just think how great he was. Even the partridge Abraham gave him a tenth part of the plunder. Now the law requires the descendants of Levi who became priests to collect the tithe from the people, that is, from their fellow Israelites, even though they also are a descendant from Abraham. This man, however, did not trace his descendants from Levi. Did you hear that? He did not trace his descendants from a covenant. Is that okay? So again, I really want to push the point forward to you that this is an order. Totally, completely different from inheritance. Your salvation is intact before you ever confessed. See, I believe in reconciliation of all things. You don't know how many all things I mean. I mean everything. Did you hear that? I'll leave you a point here at the end of this, but I don't want to get you really bum fuzzled. But I'm going to leave you with a serious thought before I leave here today. Okay? This man, however, did not trace his descendant to Levi. Okay? Verse 7. And without doubt, the lesser is blessed by the greater. In the one case, the tenth is collected by people who died. But in the other case, by him who is declared to be alive. One might even say that Levi, who collected the tithe, paid tithe, or tenth, through Abraham. Because when Melchizedek met Abraham, Levi was still in the body of his ancestors. Is that not a truth? Did not Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, all of them, bless the generations beyond them? Amen? See, we are walking in such a powerful day and a powerful word in this hour that we now live in. We're not just living this for us. It ain't about us. It ain't about us at all. Amen? We want to make everything about us, and it's not. 
It's about him. Amen. So he blessed the ancestor. Jesus like Melchizedek. Verse 11. Scroll up a little for me. If perfection could have been attained through the Leviticus priesthood, through that priesthood, through that order, and indeed the law given to the people established that priesthood, why was there still need for another priest to come? One in the order of Melchizedek, not in the order of Aaron. For when the priesthood is changed, there's a change. Amen? Very important word. Okay? The law must be changed also. Okay? Now watch. There's something that's going to take place here. I'm not talking about the Ten Commandment laws. I'm talking about even in this new walk we are walking in right now, we have established laws. They got to change. Look, people, if we're going to be a people of God, what you know yesterday is not good enough for this day. Can you hear me? Some of you are holding on to things that you've held so dear. You know the hardest thing to relieve people from is those last revelations that has blessed them so much. If you're not willing to give them up, you're not going to walk in Melchizedek order. Amen? How many of you know that Jesus never was tempted with evil? He was tempted with good. It isn't your evil things. You know, most of y'all know what evil. It's your good things that's going to snag you. Amen? Some of these precious things that you've thought so good. See, the trees is not just evil, it's good and evil. Amen? Where am I at, Dale? Verse 13? Yes. He of whom these things are said belongs to a different tribe. We ought to understand that, right? There's a different tribe coming. It's been the lost tribe of Israel. How many of you know what that is? It ain't Cherokee or Choctaw or Sagan Fox. <laughs> Can you hear me? It's a spiritual tribe of people that understand spiritual concepts of who Christ really is. Amen? What's been lost out of traditions and everything is spiritual people. Amen? So there's a different tribe. No more from that tribe has ever served at the altar. For it is clear that our Lord descended from Judah. Did you hear that? Which tribe was never mentioned? In regard to that tribe, Moses said nothing about priests. <laughs> nothing about it. So it's not an ancestral deal. Amen? Go on up. Where we at? Verse 15. This gets really good here in a minute. And what we have said is even more clear if another priest like Melchizedek appears. One who has become a priest not on the basis of a regulation as to his ancestral. Amen? But on the basis of the power. This is the key right here. This word right here will put it in perspective what he's talking about, Melchizedek order. And that's what I'm going to talk to you about. That single word right there. What is it? What is it? It is based on the power of an indestructible life for it is declared ye are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. Yeah. Boy, people, if you can't get a hold of that, that turned my world upside down. Listen, if it's an indestructible life, it had to go through some destructions. How do you know you got eternal life if death don't come? How do you know what to do about anything? What's he talking about? He's talk, Did Jesus not walk out Melchizedek? Huh? Well, did, did he have peace on this earth? 
How many of you ever played, oh, Lord, make me one? And then God begins to make you one. And all hell breaks loose in your life. I mean, hell breaks loose in your life. Because, see, your concept about being unitized with Jesus is walking around healing everybody. Amen? Walking around speaking a word to everybody. See how delusional we have become? How drunken we have become on doctrines? He said that this life is an indestructible life. In other words, it's able to go through any hell that this world, the devil, or whatever you want to call it today, is able to throw against it, and it can still stand and say, I am of the Lord. Amen? True testings. What? Peter. You know, Peter recovered, thank God. In 2 Peter, I think it's chapter 4. You don't have to turn there. I'll just paraphrase. Peter said, think it's not strange concerning all the diver's temptations that you're fixing to enter in. I want to ask you something. Was Peter putting forth bread and wine? Could Peter have made that statement to count it all joy if he had not experienced what he did at the cross with Christ? He couldn't make that statement. Do you understand that? He could not have wrote 1 Peter chapter 4 if he hadn't went through what he did at the cross when he ran from the servant girl and say, I do not know him. There's no way he could have made that statement if he had not went through that test. How many of you know what temptation does? I'm going to tell you, every one of you here this morning, time you get out of here, you're going to be tempted. You're going to be tried. And oh, guess what? You ain't going to come into a new peaceful land. The next land will bring another set of trials, another set of testings. I'll prophesy that over to you today, and I'll guarantee you 100% of it's going to happen. Just like my daughter. I've been through 10 months with her now. Now she's about to enter back in society. She's about to enter into the electronic world. She just bought her a phone. Guess what? A brand new set of trials is fixing to hit the Jameses. Amen? Because now she's got to learn to walk out here. She's been under our protection, under our nourishment. Now she's got to learn to walk back in society and walk and walk above temptations and all that. So I prophesy that's an absolute truth. Amen? Okay, this is what I want to say to you. Temptation did not plant the desire there. Temptation simply reveals it. Amen? See, when when David was tempted, what did it discover within David? He was supposed to be, it said, the Bible says this, that it was a time when David should be out Warring, but he was sitting at ease on the top of the castle's balcony. And he looks down and he sees a fair maiden. Oh, we look at that as a woman, but see, I don't. I look at that at this. Oh, I see a good doctor in there that, boy, I'd really like to put in my life. So David was tempted. So when he was tempted, what happened? Did the temptation place what was already in his heart? Or did the temptation bring out what was in his heart? It revealed it. The temptation never puts it in there. It simply reveals what's there. Right? So now count it all joy. Because watch. Oh, we sit here and we say, oh, God, you know, you show it to me. I'll judge it. No, you won't. There's some deep, dark secrets in you right now you won't dare touch. Come on. There is some deep things in you that you you thought been hidden for a long, long, long time. And been gone. Amen. David said it this way. He said, no man knoweth the heart except God. For you to sit there and me to sit here and tell you I know my own heart, I'm a liar. Amen. 
I know this is hard, people, but I'm telling you, this is Melchizedek order. Melchizedek has to have bread and wine to feed this generation that's coming out of that. So they think it's not strange. It's not a, oh God, it's not a rose garden like I was told. Oh, get saved and go to church. You'll drive a new car and have a brand new house and all these good things. None of this was ever told me. And when it hit me, it like to destroy me, Lummy. But I'm here to tell you that you're headed for hell. You're not going to live, live, live. You're going to die, die, die until you're resurrected into the newness of him. Oh, hallelujah. See, I don't have nothing to lose. I can tell you the truth and walk out of here. Amen? But nobody knows our heart except him. And he knows exactly what test and trial to pour that junk out of you, boy. Mm. Man, man, man. What some times are coming? Everybody's thinking these good times? I don't see good times coming. Not on this old man. I see bad times coming on him. Because see, he's got to die. Every ounce of him. You cannot drag one atom of him in here. Not one atom of him can walk into this Melchizedek order. If you look what, you know what Abraham battled? Look. His brother had just been taken from Solomon. Solomon is a place of natural flesh. Lovers of men. Lovers of own selves. Amen? His brother had just been captured. You know what moved Abraham to fight against that? Was his brother being taken. Okay? He, he destroyed five kings. There's five senses made up in the human mind. All right, we got the feel, touch, taste, uh, Sight and what? Here. Five senses. Those five senses Abraham conquered. I'm going to tell you what. When you fight those five senses, you need bread and wine. What Melchizedek had to offer Abraham was bread and wine after he had been in a battle. Not to tell him something good thing, but Melchizedek could not give him bread and wine unless this last part of this scripture that I just read to you about a, a life that could not be destroyed. And if that life was not destroyed, it had to go through things to show it that it was, could not be destroyed. Do you agree with that? Amen? So, what's, what's Melchizedek order? Is it coming clearer and clearer to you? To where you are walking through tests and trials. And it don't matter what you're going through. You know that he's true. You know that he's absolute. And though it look like I'm not in unity with nothing, I'm in unity with him. And I don't blame nothing on the devil. And I don't blame nothing on this. It's God. Yeah. It's just like Job. God loosed the devil in God, Job's life for a reason. Why? To show Job who God really was. Yeah. His primitives. The things that he so trusted in were all taken. Right. All of his rituals, all of his sacrifices were all tested. Amen? To when it said Job woke up in the middle of the day, and guess what? I cursed the day that I lived, or I was born. Do you know what? When Job was in that circumstances with God, that was God in his life, people. Until we get to the place where we recognize no matter what's touching my life, it's God, we ain't in Melchizedek order. Amen? Amen. The greatest thing that, I've, that I feared was to face those things that my daughter and everything, and God would speak to me. They're going down this road. Oh, God, I can't. I can't do it again. They're going down this road. He was honest with me. I see them. They're going down this road. God, I can't take it again. He said, I know you can't, but I can. The thing I feared, you know what it, Job said? The thing I feared come up on me. You know what come up on him? God. Boy, I hope y'all can hear that. The thing that I feared has come up on me. God. 
He had three, he had, I, I love this, he had three good friends there that was trying to tell him everything that was going on. The devil's in your life, you got sin in your life, you got all this, and Job, I love what Job said. Job said, I didn't take none of their word on it. I knew who was in my life. You want to hear Melchizedek order? Hear it. Melchizedek order is an endless life. It has bread and wine for those that's going through those things, not to patty over them, not to say, hey, everything's going to be okay in your life, brother. But I'm telling you, you're going to be tested, you're going to be trialed, and you're going to go through things that you think you ain't going to make it. This is order. Amen? Sometimes you're going to want to give up. Everything ain't going to be a honking door and say, I believe every word that God says, bless God. I don't. There have been many a times I hadn't believed God. Oh, boy, that, that cringes your religion, don't it? <laughs> How can a preacher say that? Son, I've been in hard times with God when I didn't even know there was a God. I'm telling you the truth. Amen? Did that make God any less because I didn't believe he was there? <laughs> God's beyond my belief. He's beyond my feelings. He's beyond my understanding. Oh, glory if you can hear me. It don't bother him if you don't believe him. It don't bother him one bit. <laughs> Everybody say, oh, I offended God. You can't offend God. You ain't got the ability. I'm sorry, you're not that big. <laughs> Amen? But it's an ever, it, it's a, it's a everlasting life. It's a life that is able to overcome all the circumstances. It's not a life that's going to keep you out of the circumstances. It's a life that's going to take you through them. Amen. That's as true as I can preach to you, Melchizedek Dick Order. Amen. Melchizedek order don't come through tipping through the tulips and say, hey, I pray and I believe God at every word and I take him at every word that he takes. How do you know God's word's true until it's proven? You're a fool if you say you do. Every word of God shall be proven. Every word in you shall be proven. So if you think you got something of God, guess what? If it stands the heat and the fire and the consumption and all that stuff and it's still standing at the end, you can say, hey, I got a real word of God. It's still here. Amen? But if it burns up, notice that what Peter said, think it's not strange concerning the fiery trials that shall trial you. Now, if they're fiery, guess what? That means they got to have a purification in it. I'm not going to leave you hanging with thinking just all this is just to try you and see how tough you are. Because these tests are fiery trials. They are purifying trials. They are purifying your spirit, soul, and body so that we come forth as gold. Amen? None of the polluted of the pebbles of the humanity, of society, of Christianity, of religion, or whatever you want to call it today, is able to pass through that fire. It will be burned up. Amen? Every man's work will be proven. It ain't enough to say, how hey, I believe this. <laughs> That's only the beginning of it. Amen? If you look through every true man of God, it wasn't, it, it wasn't the way that we hear it today, that everything just went hunky-dory with them. They were just blessed beyond measure. <laughs> hey, Abraham was the father of faith, and he lied three times. <laughs> uh oh What happened to your big father of faith? David was an old orderly priesthood, and he committed murder and adultery. Come on now. That's what I'm talking about. It's in those tests that we really see who we are. You can't say, nobody here, nobody, including me, can't say what you truly have in your heart. Because I'm going to tell you something. God will bring a trial to really show you. And it's not for the destruction because he sees there's nothing that can be hidden from him. 
He goes to the very root and he roots that thing out. Why? Because that's the thing that's destroying us. And when he gets through, there'll be a Melchizedek order. Amen? Melchizedek order don't come any other way. It don't come because you can pronounce Melchizedek or you know all the Greek and the Hebrew definitions of it. It's coming through fiery trials. Amen? So you wonder why there ain't much preached about Melchizedek order? That's the reason. It won't build a church, but it'll build a people in an order. Amen? Amen? And that's what I'm about, building a people that it's able to walk in this world no matter what hits them. It's my Father. God's got a purpose in it. There's a purpose in everything that God does. We may not understand the purpose. And I'm telling you, there are some of us has walked in hard places and there's hard places yet to walk because there's still flesh that has to be dealt with. And when God, I'm going to tell you what, I, I, I don't know about y'all, but everybody looks at the future and they say, oh, what a grand. I don't. I look at the future and I tremble. You know why I tremble? Because I see where God's taking us. That's what I see. Oh, you say, oh, that, that's good. Oh, wait until you get in the midst of it. And he starts taking that dear thing you have in your life that you love so much. Amen? Because he's, he's not satisfied with 30. He's not satisfied with 60. He's satisfied with 100. It's a hundredfold ministry that he's going for. Amen? Sons of God. Melchizedek, the great high priest that has bread and wine that can preach to a creation, not, <clears throat> not preach a little Millie Mouse message to tell them everything's going to be all right in their life. Yeah, everything's going to be all right, but you're going to go through some hard times, hon. You're going to go through some difficult times. Everything ain't going to be, oh, Lord God, praise you all, hallelujah. It ain't going to be that way. I'm sorry to tell you, but here in the real world where we live, Follow Jesus' life. You want to be one with him? Guess what? The sufferings of him is going to be with you, also with the good. See, when we pray union with Christ, we only think about the good. We don't think about the sufferings. Count it all joy when you suffer as he suffered. So when you pray in union with him, you're getting everything he walked through. Crucifixion, crown on the thorns in your mind. Can you hear me? The, the literal flesh being stripped off your back by problems and situations, all of that is coming with union with Christ. Every bit of it. You know, that part, it, it's funny to me that most Christianity leaves out that part of Scripture. And we build a bunch of, uh, 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 I don't know how do you say it, fantasized Christians that lives in a bubble, and then when the real fire hit or the war hits, they don't know what to do. I don't believe in that. I've had hell ever since I started this walk. My walk started in hell. Immediately, God separated me from everything that I loved. I fell at an altar one night. I didn't fall at an altar. I, I kneeled in the middle of a church weeping and crying my eyes out because God dealt with me. Preacher didn't preach. Nobody was around me. I just wept and cried. Nobody could take, say, hey, we, we preached such a good word. Dennis got saved tonight. I didn't. I went into a church and I was under such conviction before I got there. Nobody had to say anything. I fell in the middle of the pew and began to weep and disrupted the whole service. They really didn't know what to do with me. I sure didn't know what to do. All they know was, as a lot of people knew me down there, and they said, you know, this man I know, and I know what he was before, and for him to do that, I had to be God. I used to have people come to my church just to come to say, realize, hey, I can't believe he's really preaching. There's a lot, Paul, you know, hey, this, this man killed everybody before. Now he's preaching. You know? So my whole walk has been that way. 
Listen to me, Clifton, and I'm not saying about nothing about this church or anything, but this is my calling. This is, and I can't put my calling on y'all. But what I'm trying to say is, in a, in a call sense, for is what God's wanting us to do. It is in, in, you know, God will shut down a church just as much as He open one up. And I'm not saying this church is going to shut down. That's not what I'm saying. But He did mine. And most people thought I missed God, but I didn't because God told me three months before it happened what was going to happen. But was I, was I to walk in what the people thought I ought to do or was I to walk where God showed me? I chose to walk where God showed me. You know what it cost me, sis? Ten years by myself. Ten years alone. People, I don't know about you, but ten years is a long time. I never preached a word. I never went anywhere. My friends couldn't find me. It cost 10 years of being alone. But I was in complete unity with the Father. See what I'm trying to say to you? Don't get caught up in unity as a group of people coming together and having everything to say. It's a group of people that is focused on God and it don't matter what direction you go in, it may be total against the order that you are seeing in that day, but you know that you're seeing what God wants you to do. Can you hear that? Amen. Unity is not a fleshly thing. Are you hearing me? It's it been one in the spirit. Been one and united in him. Jesus was the only man that was in one with the Father in that day that he walked in. And if you were to look at his life and judge his life, he looked like he was in total non-union with everything that was happening in that day. Is that not right? So, I don't know about y'all, I want to follow a true pattern. Amen? That's the only pattern I got. Look, people, if we lose the focus of Christ in anything we're doing, whether it's good, whether it's, whether it's not, we have lost our focus because no unity will be unilized until it's unilized in Him or unity in Him. Amen? Amen? And it can be totally against what other people think. Amen? And that's what I really want you to get a hold of. It's Him. And some of you are called to walk that. Not all of you, but some of you. Amen? And it's a frightful thing. It's a frightful thing. Hey, when you're, when you're walking in the things of God, look, if it's common knowledge to everybody, you're probably not walking in what God's wanting you to do right now. If everybody knows what God is saying right now, God's probably not saying it. Can you hear that? Because see, God is speaking a new thing. So if it's a new thing, I've not heard it yet. And you haven't either. And I can guarantee you that the majority of the people has definitely not heard it. <laughs> Amen? Amen? Now, if I want the old common thing every day, look, if you, if you don't want your life to change, then continue on doing what you're doing. Continue on believing what you're believing. I bless you, but I got to go. There's things that I've got in the Father I've not heard. Amen? Just like this right here. I've never heard that before. I've read it 10,000 times, sis. I can't tell you how many times, I, and I'm not bragging on myself, when I, when I started reading, I, wrote, I read the Bible from front to back probably hundreds of times. Couldn't put it down. I've read that many times but never seen it. I've heard Melchizedek preach many times but never heard it. Amen? But it's changed. I heard something different in it. You know what I heard? An uh, everlasting life. A life that can endure every trial, every test, everything. And when it comes through that, guess what? It's in an order of Melchizedek, and it has bread and wine to feed those that have been fighting those five senses in their realm that they don't understand 
that they've been told it's the devil and everything else, and it's wrong. Amen? I told you I was going to leave you with a nugget. I'm going to leave you with something really to think about. This is for all you devil people on Facebook. Are you ready? In the book of Revelations, what are you going to do with the scripture? We believe in the purifying fire, right? We believe that's the only fire there is, right? What are you going to do with the scriptures when it says there in the book, last, last part of the book of Revelations where it says that the devil and Satan himself shall be cast into the lake of fire? What are you going to do with that? I'm going to leave you with that. I could preach on it, but I don't know whether y'all's ready. I'm going to leave you with that. Amen. God bless you. I'm through. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm.